Hello and welcome to our worship service this weekend. It's good to have everybody here with us uh, tonight, Saturday evening. Good to have you with us who are watching online. Uh, it's good to be in the Lord's house together to worship him. The topic before us this weekend is maybe not the most comfortable topic for us. No, it's not money, but it is confronting other people's sin. Not something that we ourselves like to do, and yet our Lord instructs us that it is our responsibility to do. So today, as we look at our readings, as we uh, focus on our gospel from Matthew, uh, we're going to see what Jesus has to say to us about uh, why we confront sin and, and what the goal is in confronting sin as well. So we ask our Lord to bless our worship this weekend. We'll begin with our opening hymn. The Lord is present in his sanctuary. stand as we approach our God. O Creator, to you darkness is light, and a thousand years is as a day. Before we speak, you know our thoughts. There, there is, is no, no place, place we can flee from, from your, your sight. sight. O most holy Lord, 
our relationship with you requires a personal integrity we do not have. We are cut to the heart to realize that you judge every thought, word, and action. We have we been have arrogant, arrogant to, to challenge, challenge your laws. laws. We, we have, have been, been foolish, foolish to excuse our lust for more as a basic human need. We, we have blamed our unhappiness on others. Our self-centeredness is the worst affliction on earth, and we no longer deny it. O oh God of wisdom, we have wandered from your ways. We do not deserve leniency. The only thing we possess is our guilt. O oh Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we can speak your name only because you are the God of grace. Jesus came to be the sacrificial lamb who has taken away the sin of the world. Because you have gathered all the lost, we plead, be our shepherd. triune God knows our needs. He remembers that we are dust. He gloried in doing for us what we do not deserve. Before we existed, the Father sent his one and only Son to trade places with a world of sinners. In the fullness of time, Jesus packaged his honor in humility and was born into our world. By his flawless life and innocent death, he ransomed the world from sin, Satan, and damnation. The Holy Spirit raised him back to life to guarantee that we who trust these truths are God's children and heirs of heaven. Amen. From time to time, we like to review different parts of the Catechism. This weekend, we review the second and third petitions of the Lord's Prayer. 
Your kingdom come. What does this mean? God's God's kingdom kingdom certainly certainly comes comes by by itself, itself, even even without our prayer. prayer. But we pray in this petition that it may also come to us. How does God's kingdom come? God's kingdom comes when our Heavenly Father gives His Holy Spirit so that by His grace we believe His Holy Word and lead a godly life now on earth and forever in heaven. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. What does this mean? God's good and gracious will certainly is done without our prayer, but we pray in this petition that it may be done among us also. How is God's will done? God's will is done when he breaks and defeats every evil plan and purpose of the devil, the world, and our sinful flesh, which try to prevent us from keeping God's name holy and letting his kingdom come. And God's will is done when he strengthens and keeps us firm in his word and in the faith as long as we live. This This is his good and gracious will. Let us pray. Lord, we pray that your mercy and grace may always go before and follow after us, that loving you with undivided hearts, we may be ready for every good and useful work. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our first lesson for this weekend is recorded for us in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 3, where we receive the message that we need to watch out for our brothers and sisters, watch out for the dangers that are coming upon them, watch out that they might turn from those dangers and live. Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the people of Israel, so hear the word I speak. And give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, You wicked person, you will surely die, and you do not speak out to dissuade them from their ways, that wicked person will die for their sin, and I will hold you accountable for their blood. But if you do warn the wicked person to turn from their ways, and they do not do so, they will die for their sin though you yourself will be saved. Son of man, say to the Israelites, this is what you are saying. Our offenses and sins weigh us down, and we are wasting away because of them. How then can we live? Say to them, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, people of Israel? This is the word of our God. We'll continue by hearing an anthem. We're going to hear an anthem by our preschoolers. uh, And uh, usually we do that by having them come into our church and sing for us. However, during this time, we we thought this might be a better way to do it. We took a recording of them singing their song, and we're going to play it for you up on the screens. And and this is our plan of of how we're going to introduce children from the school singing, at least for now, in church. We'll record and and, uh, let you watch these songs and hear them proclaim God's praises uh, via video. So we'll hear from the preschool choir. Jesus love is above and over. Jesus love is above and over. Jesus love is above and over. All day Jesus love is above and over. Love is above and over. Love is above and over. 
Jesus' love is a bubbling over. How true that is. We're going to continue with our children's message. So kids who are watching online, uh, feel free to gather around the TV and, and come close to here. We just read in our first lesson that we need to be watchmen. I wonder if you know what that means. What is a watchman? Well, let me show you a picture. Here's a picture of what a watchman is and what he does. So back at that time when, when God was talking to Ezekiel, this is, this is what people did to protect their people from uh, invaders. They would have a wall or a tower, and there would be somebody on top of that wall tower, and they would watch. They would look out into the distance and see, is there anything out there? Anything coming towards us that might be a danger, maybe an enemy coming to attack, right? And if they saw something, they knew what to do. They would take out this horn, and you can see the horn in the picture. The horn was, was actually from a real animal. It was a, a ram's horn. A ram is a, a boy sheep, right? So they would take a ram's horn, and they would use that like a trumpet and go... <laughs> And by making that sound on their ram's horn, they would warn everybody around, everybody in their, their town, their city, whatever kind of settlement it was, that there was something dangerous coming their way. Now think about what would happen if that watchman failed to blow on his ram's horn. If he wasn't watching, maybe, or maybe he forgot his horn or, or whatever, what would happen? That, that dangerous enemy, whatever was threatening the rest of the people, would come and it would do some damage, wouldn't it? Maybe the, the enemy would, would defeat the town and, and kill all the people or, or steal all their belongings. So it was really important that the watchman do his job. Well, that's why God called Ezekiel a watchman in our reading that we just read. Because he had an important job too. He had a, the job to watch out for danger that was coming to the people of Israel. But not like the danger of an enemy army, but the danger that was there for their souls. Spiritual danger. Sin. Ezekiel's job was to look out for the sin that threatened the people's lives, and to warn them about it, to say, stay away from that. Don't do that. And you know what? God gives each of us that same responsibility. He, he tells us that we too are watchmen. We too need to look out for the things that could be dangerous for each other's souls. Things that maybe would take us away from Jesus and his word. He tells us we need to warn each other. And so, kids, think about how you might do that. How might you be a watchman? Maybe it's when you see someone else on the playground at school and you see someone, someone hurting another, another kid on the playground or saying mean things. It's your job to step in and, and tell that person, hey, you know you're doing something that's wrong. You're, you're sinning and this... This could be dangerous not only for the other person who's, who's being hurt, but that could be dangerous for you too, for your soul. Okay? Or if you see a brother or a sister and they're, they're not doing what mom and dad want them to do, they know what they're supposed to do, but once mom and dad leave the room, they, they come up with something else. They, they, they intentionally disobey. Well, that's dangerous for them too. And it, it's our job to, if we see that, to tell them. That's not what we should be doing. That's dangerous for our souls. Or if you notice that somebody doesn't want to go to church or doesn't want to, to, to read their Bible, well, that's something to talk about too, to warn them to say, hey, that's dangerous for your soul. So there's all kinds of ways that this could come up, but, but we need to be the watchman God asks us to be because if we don't, then that other person might have some serious damage done to their soul. They might, in fact, 
lose out on what Jesus has promised to give them, which is heaven and eternal life, right? So pray to God that he's going to have others watch out for your soul and that he'll give you the strength, too, to watch out for, for other people's souls, too. Let's pray and ask him for that now. Lord Jesus, we thank you for uh, taking responsibility upon yourself, first of all, that, that you came to take away all of our sins and uh, give us life eternal. Help us to be a watchman for others around us, to, to look for uh, sin and to confront it, to warn other people, so that they don't lose out on your precious gift of salvation. We pray in your name. Amen. Our second lesson for this weekend is written for us in Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 2. And he gives us a good example here of what it means to confront sin. We see how he confronts the apostle Peter when Peter was in the wrong. And he did it so that he could preserve the truth of the gospel, so that the gospel itself wouldn't be damaged and other people led astray. When Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face. Because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them all, You are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. But if in seeking to be justified, by, justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves also among the sinners, doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, then I really would be a lawbreaker. For through the law I died to the law, so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. This too is God's word. Our verse of the day. Alleluia! Everything was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Alleluia! Continue with our sermon hymn in unity and peace.
Grace, mercy, and peace be yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Your brothers and sisters in Christ, before World War II began, Hitler tested the fences. Here's a picture that, that shows how that happened. First of all, in 1936, he sent 20,000 troops into the Rhineland, which was uh, an area of land between Germany and France that was deemed a demilitarized zone after World War I. No military to be in that area. But Hitler did that. No one opposed him. Then, in 1938, Germany annexed Austria to the south. No one stopped him from doing that either. And then, six months later, they came up with this arrangement called the Munich Agreement, which Great Britain had helped to plan and implement and agree to. And the Munich Agreement said, basically, okay, Hitler, you can have this other patch of land called the Sudetenland, part of Czechoslovakia, it's the, it's the pink, purplish area there in the picture. We'll give you that if you promise that you'll be satisfied now and not take anything else. So that happened, and he took that land. Six months after that, he took the rest of Czechoslovakia. No one opposed him there either. And then finally in March of 1939, he invaded Poland. And finally, that, that was the last straw for the other nations of the world. Great Britain finally declares war on Germany, and that great, terrible war began. Now, one has to wonder, because a lot of historians look back at, at what happened there, and they and they place some blame on Great Britain and especially Neville Chamberlain, its prime minister of the time, for this policy of appeasement that, okay, we're just going to let this keep going, we're just going to give him what he wants, and eventually he'll be satisfied and, and stop going down this road. It'd be interesting to know, what if? What if Hitler had been opposed from the get-go? Would things have turned out still the same way? Maybe. Or would millions of lives have potentially been saved? We're not here to talk about world wars, but we are here to talk about spiritual warfare and what Jesus says is our responsibility when it comes to other people's souls. Other people's souls who are involved in this battle. A battle against sin and Satan. And a battle to hang on to the promises of, of forgiveness and eternal life that Jesus has given to each and every one of us. And we have a, a part to play in that battle to protect those around us. And so in our gospel reading for today, Jesus tells us what he wants. He says he wants us, there we go, he wants us to confront sin. Not something that we enjoy doing, yet something that Jesus tells us is our responsibility nevertheless. So Jesus wants us to confront sins. Why? Because first of all, you and I are our brother's or sister's keeper. We are responsible for them. And number two, because Jesus desires our brother's or sister's salvation. And because he desires it, so do we. So as we consider these thoughts this weekend, we're going to turn to Matthew chapter 18. 
verses 15 to 20. We'll read those now. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you've won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. This is the gospel of our Lord. Uh, af after the transfiguration, that, that's the point in Jesus' ministry that we're at here, uh, not too far then from his journey to Jerusalem and his crucifixion and all those things. But after that transfiguration moment, they come down the mountain and, and he and his disciples spend a little time yet in uh, Capernaum, Jesus' adopted hometown when he's an adult. And uh, there in Galilee, he does a little bit of preaching and teaching. And this is part of that that preaching and teaching that he does. He focuses on some different themes. He talks about who the greatest is in the kingdom of heaven. He talks about not giving offense to other people, causing them to, to stumble in their faith. And he talks about going out and confronting sin in our brothers' and sisters' lives. He also addresses the topic of forgiveness, and we'll hear more about that one next week, very much connected to, to this. But for our purposes today, we want to focus on what Jesus wants us to do, which is confront sin. And here's why he says we should do that. He says, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault. Highlighted that word your. What does that mean? If it's your brother or sister, it means they belong to you, right? It means you have a special relationship with them. And we're not talking about a, a physical blood relationship. We're really talking about something deeper than even that, right? We're talking about the relationship that, that Jesus himself has established between those who have faith in him, right? Right? A relationship that's going to last not only for this life, but for all eternity too. He says, those people are your brothers and sisters. And as such, you have a responsibility towards them. And he tells us what that responsibility is too. He says, go and point out their fault. Go and talk to them if you see that they have sinned. And not, not just sinned against you. Some translations have that in there. But, but the idea really is if they've sinned at all. Because let's face it, if they have sinned, whether it's against you or somebody else or against nobody at all but God, it means that they have sinned against God. It means that they have tarnished God's reputation among you. It means that they need correction then from whoever is there to do it. So Jesus says we have a great responsibility because of this relationship that we share. Just like he mentioned in Ezekiel, and we talked about this in the children's lesson, right? If you see danger coming, sound the warning. Let them know that the road they're going down is going to lead to disaster. Or you can think about it this way, too. You know the story of Cain and Abel? The first children of Adam and Eve. And Cain ends up murdering his brother because he's envious of him. 
Now, Cain was not a believer in God. And when God comes to Cain to confront him about his sin, what was Cain's question? It's a famous question these days, right? Am I my brother's keeper? I have no responsibility towards him. How should I know where Abel is? And isn't it interesting that Cain, even though he was an unbeliever, God still considered him responsible for his brother. Still considered that he should be looking out for his blood brother and taking care of him. Well, if that's the case, even for unbelievers, how much more isn't it the case that we who are spiritually bound to each other, that we too have a responsibility to care for each other and especially to care for each other's souls. You and I have a responsibility. Jesus wants us to confront sin. And yet, how good are we at doing that? Do we find ourselves asking the same question that Cain asked? Am I my brother's keeper? Am I my sister's keeper? especially when it comes to their spiritual welfare. Because we can think of all kinds of reasons not to be, right? Well, I'm not qualified to talk to that person about this or that. Or, or I'm afraid to because they might reject me. I don't want to lose a friendship or, or even worse, a, a, an actual family member. Or maybe we decide, well, we can rationalize this. We, we see what they did, but, you know, God talks about that sin. But maybe, maybe God didn't mean that for now. Maybe that was just for a different time, a different place. And, and really, we can, we can justify what that person is doing and, and call it not sin. We are very good at finding all kinds of ways to abdicate our responsibility towards our Christian brother and sister and say, nope, I'm not going to approach them. I'm not going to say anything. But you and I need to realize that that decision not to confront them is all by itself sin. Right? That is doing wrong. That is doing the exact opposite of what Jesus has asked us to do. And we've all done it. I know I have. And how much worse, right? I'm, I'm called to do that. I'm a, I'm a pastor. All of us have failed in our responsibility to be our brother's keeper or our sister's keeper, to confront sin. And we need to recognize that that sin makes us deserving of hell. When we don't take action and do what Jesus wants, he should send us to hell for that. And that knowledge should drive us to our knees in humility, right? Right? And to cry out to our God, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. I've screwed up. I've failed you in this. But God doesn't leave us there on our knees. He lifts us up when we repent of our sin and even for this sin of failing to confront others. I mean, think about how great our Savior is. There was no one more responsible, right? Fulfilling all of his duties, everything that God asked of him. How amazing that he felt so responsible for us, sinful human beings, that not only does he confront us on our sins. He finds ways to do that, right, in all of our lives. But he became our physical brother, too. 
coming into this world to show how much he cared and to set us free from our sin, to take the burden of our sins on himself, to take them away from us forever so that we would never have to worry about our status before God. And he's taken those sins of not confronting other sins to the cross as well. He set us free from them. He's made it so that we don't have to worry about them. And that gives us peace, first of all. Peace and joy. Because we know that he feels so responsible for us He cares so much for us that he went through everything to give that to us. And if he's willing to do that, can't we be willing to go to our brothers and sisters too? To, in a sense, shoulder their sins for them by by telling them what they're doing wrong? And then leading them to Jesus and their forgiveness when they have acknowledged it. Because that's exactly what Jesus wants us to do. He asks us to be our brothers and sisters keepers. And to confront their sin. But another reason he asks us to do that is because he desires their salvation. He wants them to be saved and so we want them to be saved as well. And, and look at how that plays out. We're going to look at the rest of his words here. We haven't really looked at all the rest of the reading. Uh, this is what Jesus says. There's a process to follow in order to keep your brother and sister from losing the salvation that I so desperately want them to have. Here it is. Four steps. First, approach the person privately. Second, take a witness or two along. Third, take it to the church at large. And finally, treat the person like an unbeliever. And I'm paraphrasing his words, right? At that fourth step, he says, treat them like a pagan or a tax collector. But that's essentially what he's saying. Treat them like they're outside the church. Now, a couple things become obvious as you look at these steps. First of all, you notice that it goes from private to public, right? Doesn't that show concern for that individual? This is a loving way to go about confronting sin. It's not like as soon as we hear about something or we see something, we go and we spread it as far as we can. We tell everybody. That'd be gossiping, right? That wouldn't be the right way to go about it. Instead, It's a slow, private process for as long as it can be because Jesus is concerned about that person's soul. And there's no need to go further if that person will listen to just one person or two or three. So that's one thing you notice. It goes from private to public. The second thing that you might notice here is that there's no timeline. Jesus never says, spend this long on step one And this much on step two, step three, step four. He doesn't say anything about that. He says, go to your brother, show them their fault. So he leaves it up to us as individuals to to think about what's the best here? What's the most loving thing I can do? And maybe that means taking a long time talking to that person all by yourself so that you can show them their sin. Eventually, you might have to go on to another step. But only once you've become completely convinced that that there's no way that this person is listening to you anymore. So, it's a private to public process, and it's a very patient process. Why? Because Jesus is concerned for the individual, loves that individual, wants that individual's salvation. And what's the goal? 
repentance. An acknowledgement of sin and a turning back to the Lord. Which is a very proper goal, right? And, and yet, isn't it strange then that, that so many people look at this process and they say, oh, how unloving those people are. Why, why would you do that to somebody? Wouldn't the loving thing really be more to just let that person be? Let them be who they want to be. Let them do what they want to do. And that's the message society would give us right now. And in answer to that, I give you this child with a plate of vegetables. Okay, we discipline children. Why? Because we hate them, right? Oh, wait, no. Because we love them. Because we want them to be prepared for their future lives. We want them not to self-destruct later on. And so, we teach them what they should be doing. So a child that refuses to eat their vegetables, well, we're going to teach them how important it is to eat those vegetables because they're healthy for you, they're, they're good for your body, they're going to help you live a long life. And there might have to be some disciplinary measures put into place to make sure that said child eats those vegetables. Right? But here's the funny thing. As children grow up, they become adults. Right? That's not so funny. But here's the funny thing. Why is it that suddenly when people become adults, they don't need discipline anymore? Why do children need discipline? Because they're sinful. When children become adults, do they suddenly lose out on that sinfulness? They've, they've, they've grown past it? Of course not. We all still remain sinners. And so we all still need some kind of, of discipline in our lives. And so rather than look at this process that Jesus gives to us as as an unloving thing. Let's look at it for what it is. This is Christian love for another person to make sure that they don't lose out on the great things that God has prepared for them. To make sure that they don't self-destruct spiritually. But it takes you and me to carry that process out. Jesus gives us the tools to do it. His words in verse 18. He says, Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. He's talking about like tying string and untying string. Well, in a manner of speaking, that's the image. If you bind to somebody their sin... You're telling them, you're not forgiven for this. And when would you do that? You would do that when that person stubbornly, arrogantly says that they haven't sinned. That there's nothing for them to repent of. When people refuse to acknowledge sin, Jesus says their sin remains on them. So it's, it's bound to them. It's tied to them. And so Jesus gives us that tool, another word for it, the law, right? To use for people who are unrepentant. And he asks us to do that hard work of telling someone that they're not forgiven in order to drive them again to their knees in humility so that they see how serious their sin is. But we never do that just for the sake of driving them down. Again, the, the motivation is love. The motivation is their salvation. Jesus wants them to be saved. So the goal of using the law, that, that binding key, 
is so that we can set them free. Which is what Jesus is talking about when he says, whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Because when somebody does repent of their sin, you can say to that person, you're forgiven. What awesome words. And what power, because Jesus says he stands behind it, right? Right here. Again, truly, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. In the context of these words, what is Jesus saying? He's saying, I'm right there with you. When you tell someone that their sins aren't forgiven, you have my approval on that. But when a repentant sinner says that they are sorry for what they've done and you pronounce to them forgiveness in my name, it's done. I, too, am right there with you pronouncing that forgiveness. What powerful tools we have to go out and save people's lives. And that's the whole goal, right? Right? Like, just like Neville Chamberlain could have done, maybe, if he would have opposed Hitler. How many lives might you and I be able to save by going out and saying to someone, I see this sin in your life and I don't see that you're doing anything about it. And I'm, I'm, I'm coming to you not to make it seem like I'm better than you. I have my own faults too, I know. But I just want to warn you. Because I don't want you to lose out on the gift that God has prepared for you. And then to say to that person that, that Christ forgives them when they acknowledge their sin and turn from it, what an awesome thing. I'll close out with, with one more illustration here. That's the Titanic. When the Titanic hit that iceberg, it sent out a distress signal to the ships nearby. And there were a few ships that were nearby. The closest that responded to them was called the Carpathia. But the problem was, even though it was the closest that responded, it was still a distance away. It took four hours for the Carpathia to get to the, to the Titanic. And by that time, so many people died. There was a ship that was closer. It was called the Californian. And it was only about 10 miles away or so. The, the Carpathia was 50-some miles away. The problem on the Californian was that 15 minutes before the distress signal went out, their radio operator hung up the headset, turned off the system, and went to bed. And then they were close enough that they could actually still see the ship. And the rockets that were fired from the deck as emergency distress signals. Five white rockets. And a crew member saw those and reported to the captain, there's a ship out there, just fired off these rockets. And the captain took no action. The Californian eventually did arrive on the scene, but after the Carpathia. In the next morning when the, the radio operator came back online and, and, and heard those messages. The Carpathia saved a lot of lives. How many more might have been saved if the Californian had acted when it saw evidence of danger? So then my question for you and for me how many lives might Jesus use you to save for his kingdom? Consider that and act on it with Jesus' power. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God, which transcends all human understanding, will guard your hearts through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll continue by confessing our faith. We'll use the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. 
I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. We'll continue with the song of the season. rise as we join our hearts in prayer. First, prayer for all the blessings that God gives us, thanking him for those things and asking them to, uh, asking him to use them for the good of his kingdom. We go to our Lord in prayer. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to give, which we do with joyful, grateful hearts, O oh Lord. We look at the needs of the world and our offerings are small. May they be like yeast, Gifts that grow in your kingdom, bringing a rich harvest of righteousness. 
We pray this in Jesus' name. Lord of power and grace, whose eyes are on the righteous and whose ears are open to their cry, hear the prayer of your people as we come now in thankfulness for the mercies you pour down on us anew each day. We thank you for the gifts of your mighty providence. Make us mindful, O Lord, that you have provided us with life, breath, and being and are the source of our daily bread. We praise you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent to be the Savior of the world. Grant that we may believe in him with all our hearts, learning from him the great truths of the kingdom to which he bore faithful witness. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may produce the fruits of righteousness. May he endow us with unwavering faith that we might always be ready to do your will, and especially as we consider today how to confront sin. We pray for the nations of the earth, Subdue terror and tyranny everywhere and call forth leaders who acknowledge that you are Lord over all the earth. Bless our own land. May it ever follow that which is good and turn from all that which is wicked that our people may prosper in uprightness and integrity. Hear, O Lord, our cry for those who are afflicted. Grant them health in body and soul and save them for your mercy's sake. And hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Guide and uphold us during our pilgrimage in this world and bring us all to our heavenly home. Receive these petitions in the name of the Prince of Life, Jesus our Lord, who also taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Please be seated as we conclude with our final hymn.
Once again, good to see all of you here today. Good to be able to lead you in worship and talk about the responsibility we have towards our brothers and sisters and the, the power that God gives us to do that for their salvation. A couple of announcements this weekend. Um, first of all, you may have noticed when you were coming in, there's a, a new little table out there and um, a, a trifold thing that explains how these listening devices work. So for anybody who maybe is hard of hearing and would, would like a better experience here in worship, those are available for your use. We're trying out this model, um, and if it doesn't work out very well, there's another model that, that uh, we're going to try and get and try out as well. Um, you can also, I was asked to say, that you can bring your own earphones if you want and plug into the unit with those. It just needs that three and a half uh, millimeter jack to work, uh, but uh, we also are sanitizing those those earpieces that are along with the devices. Um, so whichever way you prefer. Also, want to say this week, kind of a lot of things going on. Um, we've got some growth groups starting up. You should have seen in the weekly news a sign up for some specific groups that are being offered. Uh, a couple of those uh, you can see them also in the. Um, in the worship folder there at the end, there's going to be a, a, a group studying Ecclesiastes with Pastor Kugler on Tuesdays at 7. That's going to be via Zoom. So if you'd like to do that, you'll have to get in touch with Pastor Kugler to get the link. And uh, Tim Grams is going to lead a, a, stu a study group as well on the story of Joseph. That's going to be at his house in person. Um, so Tuesdays at 6.30 p.m. at the Grams house there. And then um, our, our other groups are listed there as well. Some of them have been, have been going for some time. And then our Sunday morning Bible class also, where we're studying Christian freedom. So I encourage you all to take part in one or more of those groups as you have opportunity. We also have an event planning meeting coming up this week. Uh, that'll be Tuesday night at 7 p.m. So if you're interested in being a part of, of planning events, here at Cross of Glory, then we'd invite you to come to that meeting so we can talk about how we're going to go about that, especially in uh, the current COVID age that we're, we're in right now. Uh, also, a couple special meetings, and these are for those who, um, who would need to take part. There's going to be a special Board of Ed meeting uh, this Monday at 8 p.m. and a special church council meeting this Wednesday at 7 p.m. So for those of you who need to know that, keep that in mind. Those are all the announcements that I have. If uh, We wish uh, the Lord's blessings on our men who are up at the men's retreat now, a, a few people um, doing that this weekend, and wish them uh, blessings on their study time there as well as safe travels back home. For those of you here sticking around for communion, we'll, we'll celebrate that in just a moment. <laughs> 